and welcome to another episode of the SD4L show. I'm Justin Thind. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Sheehan. Matt, how are you doing on this fine Wednesday night? I'm exhausted, but not because, you know, a father of two children that are just maniacs and take up a lot of energy. Not because I worked a hard day at work today, but uh, Justin, I'm exhausted because I waged a war today. Mm. Against the terrorist organization known as Bally Sports. I had to do it out with their customer service team. But uh, before that, JT, really quick, how you doing over there, man? Are, are we doing okay? Not, not to absolutely slander another company just in the first minute of this show. But uh, <laughs> look, you asked me a question, I'm going to answer it literally. How are you doing over there before I ask? I, I'm, good, I'm, man, especially, I'm good, especially because this now gives me the opportunity to slander another company that I've long hated, and that is Little Caesars. And- what you <laughs> uh, I'll drive your house right now. And, oh, God. <laughs> that. Start over again. Hit, hit record again. We're starting this over from the top. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh, no, I almost we, fell, I almost fell yeah. off this school that I've uh, had to make here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will we will avoid any further lawsuits for defamation, <laughs> and uh, I'll keep my thoughts about other companies, particularly Xfinity, to myself. Okay, that's yeah. probably smart. Um, but no, I, honestly, I'm I'm good. We won the war. Took a little bit of time. Let's go. Had to grind that axe, but uh, yeah, all good here. Gotta um, keep chopping. You know, that's all we had to do during that conversation. Um, yeah, we're, if you guys want the full details, but maybe I'll just tell it at the end of the show. It's Yes, I want all the details, every single it's very, detail. It's not as exciting as your Spirit Airlines story. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry in advance to let everyone down on that. But uh, no, hopefully the experience for all of these official visits this weekend is more pleasant than anyone's ever had. With Bally Sports Network. <laughs> How about that for a nice little segue there, JT? <laughs> yes, yes. And this weekend, we are moving on to the second such occurrence of OV weekends. Yep. Uh, last week, Michigan State had nine kids up to campus. Uh, we got quotes from eight of them over on, on our site. And the one that I couldn't get, Bradley Gompers, I believe you guys have on Spartans Illustrated. So, Plenty of quotes over there. Yep. Yes. So we, we had... Yep. Um, a lot of success kind of getting in, and talking to these kids and, and getting their thoughts on them. And it seems like the main theme that was uh, kind of recurring through every kid's quotes were that a lot of schools talk about a family environment, but Michigan State actually has kind of built one. Um, so that was great. Um, we could talk more about, I guess, that weekend. But I, I think another thing I wanted to echo along those sentiments are after we last spoke, the next day I was going to the uh, camp in Detroit, the Sound Mind Sound Body at Wayne State. Michigan State brought all 10 assistant coaches there. I believe they were the only staff that had all 10 assistants there. Um, I know the other power four schools did not. I can't say if maybe Central or um, an Eastern maybe might have had all 10. I'm, I'm thinking it was more like six, seven, just based on kind of looking around. But uh, yeah, they, they brought everybody. They're continuing to show that there's actions behind their sentiments about wanting to kind of lock down the state. Um, talked to eight of the 10 assistants on, uh, on Thursday, just great conversations all around. Um, got to speak at length with, uh, coach Chad Wilt, um, and then offensive coordinator, Brian Lindgren. Great, great conversations there. You can kind of see, um, why they resonate with kids and from a recruiting standpoint and Anthony Jones, the rush end from Indiana via the way of Oregon, he, uh, yep. was kind of the first one to give us quotes about how like Chad Willett is somebody that he really wanted to come play, play for this time around and kind of got to see why he, why he felt that way. And then you can see why Brian Lindgren got a kid and Leo Hannon to come all the way across the country and commit to him even before OV season started. And just a very refreshing conversation with him in terms of as, as far as offensive coordinators go. Um, And then, yeah, everyone else is good to talk to coach meet for a while. I'll talk to coach Hawk like always, but just uh, a lot of great personalities on the staff. And that's not to say like the last staff didn't have a ton of them, but it would be more so like every time there would be somebody that like stands out um, that, that like a, early on, like it was Will Piegler. That was like a really good personality and sure. I the whole time he was here. But like I was able to pick out like three, four, five guys on the staff here. It seems like every single person on the staff is of the same variety. So it, it really is just like a, a nice feel and and to get that insight personally and and hopefully hear share it with you guys and then also hear it from the kids all of june it, it really I, it really resonates with me kind of what they're saying about the staff from a personality standpoint 
I mean, the theme of the family was uh, everything that you saw, whether it be the quotes on Spartans Illustrator, you guys over 24-7 sports. Mm -hmm. um, it's also nice, too. I mean, you know, kids feeling prioritized when they come here. It's everything that you wanted to hear off of kids taking official visits here at Michigan State. One, namely, rivals four-star cornerback um, LaRue Zamorano. Mm -hmm. He felt the love for Michigan State early on. So, I mean, that's kind of, you know, the bar that you want to set right there. Yeah. We say it all the time here on the show when we talk recruiting. You want to be first visitor, last visit. Looks like Michigan State set the tone early on. So, yeah, hopefully that sticks moving forward here. Luckily, this upcoming weekend we have kids that have already stuck. There's going to be a lot of yeah. already kids that are committed right now. So, there we go. But one thing that from the si sound mind sound body mm -hmm. that I wanted to hit on with yes. you, Smith didn't speak a ton. But one interesting thing he did say to the media was, this is about roster construction, is the mm -hmm. roster all set? He said pretty much – Maybe one kid. Hmm. Odds of one more kid being added, do you have any insight into that, or are things kind of not looking so good for maybe one more roster addition this offseason? Yeah, I think it, it's really tricky because, like, the reason that it's murky isn't more so of how much does the kid like us or something like that. It's more of, like, the credits and the admission side of things. And when you kind of look at, some of the times where they thought that they were in the clear and then it didn't work out. Kind Two of, times. Yeah. <laughs> so like you, you never want to be too sure, but yeah. um, yeah, for the most part, like the, I know the, the guy they're talking about, I, I guess um, it's, it's kind of been on the message boards right now, former yeah. wide receiver from Ole Miss that was very, very, very good at UTSA right before that was one of the best receivers in the country two years ago. And then last year was kind of injured, didn't live up to kind of the billing. Um, definitely someone that you would like jump all over to, to give a second chance to and, and hope he finds his form from just the season before last. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, we'll find out when it, he's able to and if he's able to kind of get cleared for the next spot. But uh, yeah, like they're they're working hard. They're, they're kind of doing all they can from like a sales pitch standpoint. And I think if it's up to the, the kid, he'd, he'd be able to come here. So we'll, we'll see. Um, and uh, but yeah, that's pretty much all they're looking at, I think, right now at this point. And one more thing from last week to this week, uh, JT, the last time we talked, you personally promised us that we would have five commits, mm. I think it was. I think it was nine. Or, yeah. Nine, and that's yeah. right, a full, a, a clean yeah. sweep, just like Everybody, Rutgers yeah. did over the weekend, uh, apparently. <laughs> sure, like, that, nothing weird going on there whatsoever. Um, yeah, so uh, why, why did you lie to us? Why, why didn't all nine kids – no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um do you think any kids have gotten yeah. closer in your opinion? Do, like, do you think that we're on commit watch with any kid that visited last mm -hmm. week or now that everything's unfolded, it's been a few days. Do you think it's safe to say that maybe no visits will be canceled later on and we will have to wait it out with some of those kids? I, I think um, they're going to get one commitment from this past weekend before he takes any more visits. And gotcha. I guess since he's already tweeted his commitment data, I can speak a little more. And that's Braylon Collier from uh, Sandusky uh, yep. area of Ohio. Uh, whereas remember last time we were very fascinated by the fact that he can go to Cedar Point anytime he wants. Just the dream. Yep. Yes. God. Yeah. So he's a, he's a very speedy receiver. That's kind of the mold they're looking to stack up on this cycle. Yep. I think he's like six one one seventy or something like that. He's, he's all speed. Um, and like I said, like after they got Marsh and Jalen Brown last cycle, it's not that they don't value the big body. It's that they just got two of them. So now they want to kind of balance the room more by focusing on this, the smaller, skinnier speed guys this year. Whereas sure. then next year, maybe they can go ahead and try to rebalance just one and one or however many they're going to take, take an even share of both. But right now they feel the room needs more speed. But um, yeah, so I expect Michigan State to kind of lock him down here in the next week. He is, I think June 7th is the date he said. So okay. this, this is going to come out the morning of the 6th. So hopefully in the next uh, 30 hours or so after you guys hear this. And then um, he had official visits scheduled to Iowa and uh, suit man over there at Iowa State, Matt Campbell. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it looks like the, the new look Iowa offense wasn't something he was dying to take an OB to. If, if no. Anything. No. Yeah. Tim Lester uh, and, and his wizardry at offense wasn't <laughs> enough to pull. Okay, uh, dang, back to the drawing board for for Iowa. Yeah, over there. Um, and then I do shot. think a couple other kids got got very, very, very close to committing and kind of told that to the staff and and told that to us. But um, so yeah. I think I think what you'll see there is they're going to take their other OVs and then they'll probably commit to Michigan State, barring some massive kind sure. of other a uh, push from another school. And um, I think Brad. 
Fitzgibbon is somebody that like Michigan State a ton back yep. in April, and I believe he likes them as much, if not more, right now. So it's just uh, just kind of a waiting game of you don't want to pressure kids into saying you got to commit now, cancel your visits, and then and you're looking at like October, and suddenly they're like man, I wish I would have done more due diligence. And then they're opening up their recruitments in October. So yeah, yeah, everyone right. that commits now, you wanted to make sure that they're solidly committed. And um, they're, they're not trying to they're not trying to strong arm people into committing like they may be doing on the East Coast or, or elsewhere. And speaking of commits, I mean, there's always seemingly a weekend in June where most of the commits visit. Mm-hmm. That appears to be this weekend for Michigan State. Right now, I believe it's four guys that are already committed yep. are visiting this week. Damari Malone, Charles White, both out of Metro Detroit area. Leo Hannon, a little further than Metro Detroit. He's got to take, a, <laughs> I would guess, a plane over here. And then uh, you talk about a far hike, Jace Clarizio. He's mm-hmm. just got to walk down Abbott Road to get to uh, Michigan State this weekend. Um, but, hey, those aren't the only four visitors this weekend. Yes. Five more confirmed by UJT on top of that. that is that, is is that what I'm reading from you? I, I can count to five five correctly is that that is correct yes one, name, one two, two wow, three, look at me four, go five. yes don't tell me i'm not hit my stride man we're, we're rolling here let's go <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this weekend uh the four commits that you mentioned uh obviously the two linebackers and then leo hannon and jace clarizio so i got two guys on the offensive side two guys on the defensive side of the ball um so look for them to help with the recruiting of these these five guys or so Obviously, Leo Hannon would be um, giving the, the the very solid sales pitch to the tight end, Tyler Kielmeyer. Yep. He is from Westerville, Ohio. He went to Westerville South High School. can't remember if he went to North or South, but Dom Long, uh, the former Michigan State oh, gunner, wow, nice former DB. Yeah. Um, Former wow. mechanical engineer. Rangy. I remember him yeah. being rangy. He, he was in like most of my classes, so that's why that's why nice. I remember. There we um, go. But yeah, he went to Westerville, North or South. So same town. Uh, Michigan State's back over there, knocking on doors. So six foot seven. Last weekend, he took an official to Rutgers. Might have been the only kid in America that visited Rutgers and didn't commit. Yeah, like, but right but actually, but but really, he might yeah. be because that they, they got like ten commits and they probably hosted like eleven or twelve. Well, I'll get, like, to, the, is, we'll get is, to the bottom. Is Georgia even doing that? I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry to make this a Rutgers recruiting no. show all of a sudden, but like, we just can't let that go to the wayside and just <laughs> let that be ignored. Just Ten commits for Rutgers in one weekend. Yeah. Like, what would you even like? How does that even? You'd have it to is, give them like a tour of like Anthony Soprano's house, and for me to even be <laughs> thinking about like, man, this is a cool place. I got I got to commit here. Like, I. I don't know, man. Right. And if Nick Saban, like, you know, agrees that, you know, retirement's boring, I'm going to be a GA here. Like, uh, I don't know. I'm just going <laughs> to hang out and just do this in my free time at Piscataway. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry to derail the conversation. Tyler Kielmeyer. Uh, yes. Yeah. The only so, guy to not commit to the Scarlet Knights last weekend. Yes. Yeah. They, they should have Chris Moltisanti on the official visit, give him the tour. But, um, yeah, he's the nation's 39th best tight end according to 24 7. So, yeah. very, very highly ranked kid there. Uh, Michigan State last weekend hosted Jaden Savory from uh, Old, uh, Orchard Lake St. Mary's. He did not commit on the visit. He's the one that had the most OV scheduled out of anyone that visited the last weekend, yeah. as he had four other ones. Uh, it was an interesting slate. I think he had. Um, uh, a couple like usual suspects in there, and then he also had BYU in there. Yeah, it was like Kansas, do... BYU. Yeah, Kansas. Yeah, I think. Oh God, Wisconsin. Us. Do you know what? Now I, should fly I know yeah. Kansas BYU was on it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. BYU and Duke, I know for sure were on it, and then Kansas was for sure on it. And you're thinking like, all right, Kansas makes sense. Developmental program. Lance Leipold does a good sure. job. They recruited Detroit, and then you yeah. see BYU and Duke, and you're wondering like, what what is what is the mix that we're still looking at here? But anyway, yeah. point being, uh, tight ends coach Brian Wozniak has uh, kind of been very transparent with Kielmeyer and Savory and saying that there's one spot whoever commits first gets it we like both of you equally so come come take that second spot if you want it and um let's see if Tyler Kielmeyer does it this weekend he's probably a, a pretty much a similar player to Savory I think he's a little more refined right now in terms from a physical kind of blocking standpoint but that's also something that a good tight ends coach can teach um, but I, I think he'd probably be more ready to contribute from like a, a rotational basis, probably a year earlier than Savory, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he'd be the best player after the four years are over. Um, but yeah, right now he has uh, no other official visit scheduled. So that is interesting. I'll reach yeah. out to him to make sure that is truly the case. Uh, Cause sometimes kind of out East or down South, there's a couple like profiles I noticed that like don't have all the OV. So 
I'll send him a message right after this and I'll have that on the board um, or and on the OV uh, weekend preview that I post every Thursday. So, um, but yeah, right now Michigan State is the only the second of two visits for him behind Rutgers. Um, kind of going down the list here, another offensive guy that uh, Michigan State has this weekend, Drew Nichols. He's a six foot five interior offense lineman from Murrieta, California, from Murrieta Valley uh, High School. He's ranked as the 83rd best interior offensive lineman per 24 seven sports. He has an official visit to Boise state next weekend. And then UCLA to wrap up the month of June. He's somebody that uh, coach M has uh, been recruiting for a while. He's one of those guys that developmentally um, is, is kind of a hidden gem. I think he's outside of the top 1000 overall in the composite, even though 24 seven sports has a much, much higher than the composite. So that's kind of speaking to Coach M's track record there, where the West Coast twenty four seven guys know that. Um, hey, if Coach M offers this guy, we gotta we gotta look at it very closely and see if there's any reason to bump him up, and then they do. So it's uh, kind of continuation of that pattern. I imagine there's not like a hard number that they're looking for for offensive linemen this class. I mean, it, just wh- whoever they can get, they can get. I don't. Is, is yeah, just, I, I, yeah, I think they would, I think they would probably look at at least four, um, but I, I don't think they're necessarily looking to like take seven or anything crazy like that. Just because, because because they have bodies, their bo- the bodies are just very young. So right, that's, that's yeah. the thing. So like two OTs got hurt this year, and they're in huge trouble. But that's not Certainly. because they don't have anyone after that. They have like the Russ and Youngs and the Lunieski twins of the world. It's just um, yep. they're all they're true freshmen, and then. Saying Ramble, I guess we'll see. I, 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 I don't know how his knee is holding up just yet. So right. that's, that's not promising kind of intel that I've heard there. But um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. So this year they would be a trouble at OT. But the thing is, is that they don't need to just overcompensate and take seven guys or anything where okay. like defensive tackle or, or linebacker, they might have to take one or two Definitely. additional guys than they would in, a, in another year. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what we're looking at on the offensive side of the ball. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Abu Terawali, six foot four defensive tackle from Oseo, Minnesota, from Heritage Christian Academy. And he, this is his first official visit so far, uh, when he'll be coming to Michigan State this weekend. But then next week, he has an OV to his in state Minnesota and to Kansas State on June 21st. Um, we'll see, I guess, where Michigan State ends up standing with him. Right now, his recruitment seems to be like very, very just everything's on the even play. Like nobody's pulling ahead of anybody else, uh, which I guess is good because you'd think like the in-state Minnesota would have the leg up right now, and it doesn't sound like they do. So that's there for the taking. Um, But also, um, I'd have a very hard time playing at Minnesota if I was a college football recruit. So I don't know necessarily how big of a threat they should be, even though they are the in-state school. I guess that's off topic and, and unrelated, but just no um, nonsense. Ha- had to throw in the fact that I I have zero affinity for a PJ Flex program. Just huh. the more the more you hear about the guy like behind the scenes and the way he treats kids, like if they even tell him that he's think that they're thinking of taking an OV elsewhere if they're committed there, he's not thrilled with it. Yeah, you, <laughs> like there was a there was a tweet a couple of days ago where uh, some kid tweeted out like his his official visit schedule. And it had other schools on it, even though he's a Minnesota commit. And he said something like, even though I'm like thoroughly committed to Mich- to, to Minnesota, um, here's my OV schedule. And then like two days go by and he's like, you know, upon second thought, I'm only taking an OV to Minnesota. Now, that's one of the rare times. Well, first of all, why do you think that happened? But second of all, that's Culture one of the major. rare times where PJ <laughs> Flex tactics of how he just – goes crazy on kids and pressures them and stuff that actually works usually it goes the other way where the kid's like wow this is the real pj flag I'm, I'm just not even interested in minnesota anymore and uh shout out to uh him making it easier for michigan state last year when they were looking to recruit a linebacker that's committed to minnesota who ended up yeah. signing with msu so yeah just not a lot of not a lot of affinity for me for pj flex so that was just an All aside right. I, I, didn't, I didn't think loose commitment would bother a guy like PJ Fleck, but ne- nevertheless, um, <laughs> I do wonder. You know, you so, n- not not to just uh, repeat questions here, but obviously yes. they had brackets given on last week, and they'll have Derek Simmons. Mm-hmm. Um, right, obviously, things are fluid to change. Derek Simmons, um, also uh, Bobby Kanka, yeah. uh, just other defensive tackles that we're naming right now. Yeah. 
we just talked about like making up for lost time with yeah. defensive tackles the last class. Obviously, they have done work in the transfer mm-hmm. portal to add guys in the future. Yeah, this is a long-winded way of saying. What do you think for interior defensive linemen here? I mean, is it going to be just hard cap at two guys, you think? or is this I would like think it's at least or, oh, two. Yeah. I would think yeah. it's at least two, and they would happily take three if the third guy is one of their like favorite ones. Sure. Now, if they get – I don't know necessarily what the divide or like how big – the uh, gap between like the first or fourth guy on the board would be, but like, let's say there's it's, it's distinguishable and there is, there are gaps between each. Maybe if they get their first and second guys first, then they don't need their third guy necessarily. And maybe then they'll go portal hunting in December for somebody that maybe is a junior that can come in and contribute right away. Cause everyone they have would be young. But if, if it's going to be like they get their second and fourth guy, and then the first guy wants to commit, then I think they'd absolutely take them and take three. Uh, but yeah, I'd say at least two, possibly three. Okay, fair enough. And then, well, I mean, the next one, defensive end, right here. I don't know if you want to take it away. You're you're the one that did all the hard hard work, wrote all the <laughs> notes for these kids. Um, so I would just hate to just you know rattle all this off and just take the credit here. But Sherrod Henderson, <laughs> yeah, Sherrod Henderson, six foot four, rush end from Rocky Point, North Carolina. Very cool name for a town. Oh, that's a fun one. I like yeah. that one a lot. And then, yeah. And then the high school is Hyde Trask, also a decent name. Could be Heidi Trask, but I'm going to guess it's Hyde Trask. Yeah, say it with confidence. Yeah, yeah there we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he is coming off an official visit to the in-state Duke Blue Devils. Um, continuing my thing here of slandering all the other programs unintentionally. That's Manny Diaz's program. So, again, some of the appeal is gone just off the bat there. Um, then you're looking at an upcoming OV to South Florida on June 14th. So that's still Charlie Strong's program, right? Oh, well, I'll Google it while we talk. I don't think it is. Ooh, somebody else there. That is where he was, right? No, uh, no, 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 no. Did he? He came from South Florida to uh, Louisville. No, no, no. I don't know where he was before Louisville. Actually, so it was Louisville to Texas to South Florida, and yes. then. I and guess, now it's I uh, Alex Golish. Alex Golish. Oh, yeah. that's I don't know how I forgot that. South Florida yeah, who hosted that's... Alabama last year. And yeah, Alex Golish, by the Tennessee. way, born in Moscow, I believe. Oh, that now that's a fun fact right there. He needs to get that pipeline going. I need to see like Russian <laughs> offensive linemen all up and down his roster. Seven foot one Russian tight ends just running yeah. up to see him. Oh my god, exactly. that'd be indestructible. My yeah. goodness gracious. Can't believe I forgot that um, he was the guy there. He was one of my favorite coaches last year. So that tells you yes. how much sleep I've gotten the last couple of days. Oh, um, you're fine. You're but yeah, and then day. he goes, yeah, so he goes to USF on June 14th, and then uh Virginia Tech on June 21st. 23 total offers. So, yeah, he would definitely be a rush end under Chad yeah. Wilt's uh, scheme there. And so they got two pure rush ends in this past uh, portal cycle in um, Anthony Jones and then uh, Tyler Gillison, the Cincinnati transfer. Both have three years left of eligibility, so they're only taking one guy there for sure. Yeah. He um, he wants – Wilt wants about four guys – at, on scholarship at rush and at a given time so that is that's kind of what he's looking to do there um if chris bogle is the rush end this year because i know they tried both thompson and chris bogle at rush end my guess is one of those two would probably move down to strong side i don't know which one yet and gotcha. then the other one would say at rush end but if bogle's a rush end for example and then his eligibility is gone after this year then you definitely need one there um, i guess if thompson's there maybe you don't necessarily need one but Whoever's fourth at rush end this year, um, probably James Shot. Maybe he would look to move elsewhere or something like that. So either way, you're looking at needing no more than one, but then also not needing any less than one at rush end. So he's going to have the fewest amount of visitors, uh, which will help because they don't have a lot of OVs left. And that's why they're making sure that a lot of the guys that they host are guys that are gettable because the previous portal cycle um, from anyone that visited – Uh, here in the spring and then also anyone that's going to visit for the portal in december it's all against that same ov cap that the schools have so that's why they're being very very wise kind of with who they give the ovs to and you don't see them chasing after top 150 kids coming off two back-to-back non-bowl seasons and not having kind of much of a track record at the current school to sell them on just oregon state so i know some people wanted more star power but that's kind of the dynamic they're they're up against for sure 
Yeah, I mean, that's going to, you know, be a future conversation. Obviously, you know, you do want star power eventually here. But the honest conversation is that, yeah, you do have to work your way back up to having scores of four stars on campus. But, hey, you know, just back to Shrod Henderson right now. I mean, I believe he's 6'3", like 210. Yeah. So for a, for an, a guy that's labeled as an edge in high school, I, I believe he also plays running back, too, at his high school. Mm-hmm. Or at least he did um, last year. Like, th- that, that is the mold that you're looking for for the rush edge position yeah. right i mean joe ross yeah. requires speed at that position these guys are dropping mm-hmm. back in pass coverage all the time yeah. hard to flow it out there when you're uh clocking at like a smooth 250 or 260 you know so like yeah 63 210 that's a little like on the thinner side of things for your traditional defensive end but i mean th- that's just how unique this rush edge position is going to be for michigan yeah. state fans here it's, it's going to be a, sure. a hybrid of like three different positions you're going to have to have those defensive line tendencies but you also got to play a little bit of linebacker and oh yeah you got to cover like a safety too while you're at it so it is a specific yeah. type of player that you're looking for and i mean just you know measurables that's what you got with shroud henderson yeah and that's why like right this upcoming season like they're not going to be able to do a lot of the things that they're going to want to do down the road because like yeah, they'll right, make right. it work with whoever the rush end is, but like Chris Bogle's not dropping back and covering a running back in the flat. And like Jalen Thompson's not staying with a tight end for the first eight yards of his drop before passing him on to the safety. Like it's mm-hmm. th- because they do a lot of things uh, where they're disguising stuff. And like on Tons. third down, especially yeah. like that, like they really just can't do until they have someone that's a very good coverage guy in that rush end spot. Uh, not very good, like you, but you need someone that has, I guess, like a passable grade in that spot. And yeah. right now, I don't even know if Michigan State has any linebackers other than Wayne Matthews that would have a passable grade in coverage, let alone someone that's playing a rush end. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see how limited they are and what they can do defensively. But down the road, I, I think once they start getting the guys in their mold, they can do so much more from a schematic standpoint. And that's what they're building to. And that's why they kind of got two younger guys in, in Jones and Gillison, where even if they don't start ahead of maybe a Bogler or Thompson, they're going to have another year in their scheme. They're going to be another year older. And they'll be built for success here in the in the years coming. Yeah, that's just like the question of the offseason. Like if, if there's just one question about one position, it, it's like a, a rush edge. Like who is it? Obviously the big yeah. name is Jalen Thompson, Chris Bogle, but – I mean, guys, is it like a Jordan Turner position out of nowhere? Yeah, like, right. Ken Talley still hanging around here? Like, what, what is it that you do? I mean, could this be the spot for you? Because this is a guy that was, you know, obviously a four-star in high school, but he's just like a tweener at too many positions on the line there. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be Ken Talley, I, I but do, there's so many candidates for this. I do really like the idea of Jordan Turner dropping down there if he isn't, like, decently good in coverage as a linebacker because sure. you don't have to be as good in coverage as a rush end as you ha- as you have to be at a linebacker but then the thing is is like michigan state's linebackers have been so bad in pass coverage the last two years that like it's fans kind of forget the standard of of linebacker coverage like responsibilities yeah. like yeah. they don't have to be good to to be rush end but basically your rush end you'd hope is as good in coverage as at least cal halliday if not better so okay. like maybe if like Jordan Turner's at that level of like a of a Cal Halliday in coverage, he can yeah. play down at rush end, and you're thinking like, all right, that's not bad for a rush end, and he has the side to kind of to set the edge. But like ideally, you would want your linebackers to be like a couple of tiers better than your rush end in coverage. Yeah. So MSU might not have that. Like Wayne Matthews should be good; he should be able to hold his own. But then your other linebacker is not going to be very good in coverage. And then your rush end is going to be a guy that is okay for the rush end position. But yes, like it's, it's all going to kind of be a mess in terms of coverage abilities and stuff like that, but they'll make it work. It's just, they're going to be limited. So I I wouldn't expect their 2027 third down calls to be the same as their 2024 third down calls. No, well said. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of candidates, but that's just because like, no, it's a perfect role like that's that's kind of it it's not to say that you know that they're picking from complete scrubs i mean certainly all of them have different strengths in their game but yeah just like right right right. yeah a few years then yeah there's just just a lot of guys yeah there's just a lot of guys whose strength is fitting the run and and halliday and jordan turner and jordan hall like jordan hall is probably their best coverage linebacker last year but his strengths are still more as a being a Mike. Like he's it he's a sure. good Mike linebacker. He shouldn't be asked to play sideline to sideline just because he can do it better than Cal Halliday doesn't mean that he's very good at it. Which some fans kind of were 
biased in terms of relative to the rest of the team or where they were kind of overselling his abilities a bit, I feel like. But well, we were just looking for any so glimmer of hope, and uh, we, we were we were taking anything we could scrounge off and and just you know put yeah. it in our pipe and smoke it. We, we, were, we were we were trying our best, Justin. <laughs> I said, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm just having flashbacks to last year's Penn State game. Oof. I didn't I see a snap game. of that as as we always cover in this show. I was gonna say, how how was that game brought up for a second week in a row? I'm sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> I shouldn't be wondering how we got down that road, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I apologize. Yeah. That's unfair. I just, to uncover those scars. I just keep remembering that uh, 2022 Minnesota game. 2022. Oh my god, that despondent was the word that, that I was in the middle of that second quarter. Um, that was every single thing was a quick hitter. Every, they had no answers for the same play for, for, oh, no, I'm not going to school. I'm not going to start this podcast. And they but... tried everybody at like every position. Like <laughs> was, was coming in to cover people and he, he was giving up passes yeah. left and right. And then, they were pulling um, kids out of the student section to try to slow them down. It right. Was, they, un- I think they moved, like, An- they moved Angelo Gross around a couple of times. They like put him at the line and everyone was beating him. And then they moved him back. And then we found out he was hurt the whole season. And uh, what a mess. I think Chester Better Kimmel things to come. Done. Actually, I don't know if he played that game, but just. Uh, we we, we bring this up. We bring back the bad days to, you know, to level set us. <laughs> this is where we're starting. Before we go reach for the stars with Jonathan Smith. Yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. But, and then the what, last uh, visitor, the last visitor from this. There is one more. I'm sorry. That, that's on me. Sorry. That's on me. That's on me. No, uh, Charles Taplin, six foot one wide receiver from Red Oak, Texas. Not as cool of a name as some of the other towns, but not bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, he's a speed receiver again, like pretty much everyone on the board. I believe he's six one, 160, if memory serves. Uh, he has 10 offers right now, and he just told me a minute ago, so I'm glad we kind of delayed this. Nice. He got back to me, and he said that he does have OV scheduled to Washington State from June 14th to the 16th, and then Tulsa the 19th to the 21st. Gotcha. So uh, gotcha. those are not on his profile. I'll add them right now. But, yeah, so he has those OVs, uh, and we'll see kind of where he goes from there. But Texas receiver with speed. Uh, I'll have to kind of dive into his competition level before I jump to any conclusions, but I'm already intrigued just off the bat there. I like that Michigan State has a bar set up at six foot two for official <laughs> business, and it says if you're a wide receiver that's taller than this, you, you are not allowed on campus this cycle. Like they're making it very clear, we're looking for speed demons out there. Or, uh, or if you weigh more than your average like ninth grader. <laughs> Yes. Can't come either. Yes, yes, we are looking for aerodynamic slot yes. receivers. Make <laughs> no mistake about this. Sure, there are some, you know, five stars that are tall that can run fast, but you know, we, we don't want the gazelles. We we need some little hedgehogs out here that, that can just burn and turn off some motion off the edge. Ooh, yeah. Let's go. God, I can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna be good. It's um yeah, it's it's a good slate. Five uncommitted guys, four committed guys. Uh yep. Three defensive, two offensive, or actually no, three offensive, two defensive, and uh, hopefully Leo Hannon can uh, and Jace Corizio can work on those three offensive guys, and the two linebackers uh, work on the the two defensive guys. So we'll see kind of what happens. Um, but yeah, that that kind of wraps up this weekend's uh, OV recap. Really quick question: We don't got to go through all the names. This can be a quick uh, answer here. Yes. Biggest weekend you think of June? Is it the following one? Like, the, if I remember correctly, there's a considerable amount of names for the following. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I believe that's the one where, as we kind of touched on a little bit last cycle, there's mm-hmm. a notion going around college football that kids are not going to be dying to take the fourth weekend visit because yeah. they think the calendar's expedited a bit, and because of the portal, every class is going to be a few spots like smaller. So therefore, kids would want to lock it in a weekend or two sooner so that nobody else takes their spot in the last weekend. So the notion is that Michigan State and a lot of schools across the country, who that, and they told this to Matt Zenitz, um, who, who said that this is a national kind of notion, that the third weekends are what they're aiming to make a lot of kids' this final weekend and hoping they can get them to either cancel the fourth weekend or a lot of kids don't even have a fourth weekend scheduled or, or already right now, honestly. So um, that's that I would say is the biggest weekend, and that is how they have approached it too. Gotcha. Well, there you have it. I like that. Thanks for answering yeah. another hot seat question, JT. Absolutely, Appreciate it, man. absolutely. We should we should see. Uh, we should have a hot seat question every single time, and then track Ooh. 
how many times they give a satisfactory answer that ends up being right. But that, that would be a lot of work. So less than less was not even. They average is close to a thousand. You know, <laughs> it, it is. It is. You're doing a good job. Uh, speaking of banning a thousand, you got any good bets for us? Because this is the most miserable time of the sports year. It's, it's yes, like, I have. Got, I, have like, I have some good bets. NBA is taking three weeks to tip off their finals. Uh, NHL, I, it might even start in August. I like what? What is, what is there to gamble on? Give me something hot, JT. Let's see. So the past few days, let me open. I even had to download the Fanatic Sportsbook app, Matt, because like some wow. of the bets I wanted weren't even on either of the the mainstream ones. Real DGen hours right now. That's what I'm yeah. talking. About. <laughs> so going back, uh, let me see what I have bet on recently. Okay, so. <laughs> Cash and nice even odds parlay here, hundred okay, dollars to pay good. out, two hundred net profit of hundred. It was Jokovic, Jokovic, Zverev, and Alcaraz all winning uh, their quarterfinal matches in the French Open. There we go. That panned out. Um, you know, almost took home a big, big pickleball bet on Sunday. It didn't pan out. I had uh, Federico Staxrud. He hit Benjamin Johns. Easy dub there. Uh, Anna Lee Walters, she withdrew, so that was a push. But Salome Davice it was the even odds plus 100, and she let me down. I was watching the match, I was glued to the TV. <laughs> Just the, the, pick, the PPA tour in Dallas was riveting. You know, Salome let me down, but I think she'll be competing again in Sacramento this upcoming weekend. We'll be going back to that well. Um, and then what did I, oh, and then I bet on the Champions League final, a good little $20 to win 150. There. Okay, that's a normal sport. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was yep, that's fine. The, the, le- the, the legs were not normal though. The, the, the first leg was <laughs> great. Kareem yes. Adiemi, one plus shot on target, kind of normal. Okay. Real Madrid yeah. team goals over one and a half, pretty normal. But then the first corner kicks minutes, from the left flag only, like <laughs> you got that going on. The first 15 minutes to be a draw, that was a good lag. And okay. then Tony Cruz to have over 79 and a half total completed passes throughout the match. But and geez. they summed him out at the 84th <laughs> minute, Matt. It took me 10 minutes to find a website that even had his passes completed. No, of he course. Had ni- <laughs> he had 92 passes, I found out. And uh, that was a that was a great win. But yeah, so oh, wow. you know, I, I think going forward, a couple of bets I like. Uh, I don't know when the next darts showcase is. You can fill me in on this because I know you're a keen observer, but Whenever Luke yeah. Littler is playing again, I, I would go ahead and, and take him as a future. Now, he was only uh, – he was just plus 200 this past event on last Thursday. Yep. But he didn't win. I think he lost in the final, I believe, right? So his did, odds should have moved yeah. a ton. Right. So you can still get him plus money for this next tournament. And for yeah. those that don't know, Luke Littler is the 17-year-old that looks like he's 39, and he is the next yes. big thing in darts. Um, and then we'll see what happens in the pickleball tour in Sacramento this weekend. I'll have to evaluate some of the lines and, and then see what, what looks good. Yeah, right now at Darts, they're, they're still like halfway through like their European Masters legs. Uh, right now they're going to do Denmark, the, the Nordic Ooh. Darts Masters, and then right after the Poland Darts Masters, Ooh. right after that. But uh, yeah, no, plenty of good darts out there. Luke Lerner, like electric. He's not the future of Darts. He is the present. Of yeah. It's like that. This kid, again, which is great. If you guys don't know Luke Littler, go type in Luke Littler. You are going to think, and it's spelled just like how it sounds, you're going to think that you Googled the wrong thing because you're going to see in front of you, just like JT said, a 42-year-old man that has been hanging drywall for the better part of two decades. You know, like <laughs> this, this guy looks like any British pipe fitter that you've ever seen in your entire life. He's got no less than three kids. He's been married twice. He's been a, you know, a crippling alcohol addiction for the last 16 years. But no, the kid's like actually 17 years old. Like it is shocking <laughs> to say the least. But uh, the kid is electric at darts. So yeah, unbelievable. It's, it's, it's a shame we never go off on tangents on SD4. We always keep things pretty yeah centered and the, in, in, the in best, our swim lane here. Yeah. The, the best thing I heard there, Matt, was the fact that the next one's in Denmark and then Poland because both of those are closer to his home country of England than the U.S. Absolutely. was. So. Hopefully Absolutely. the proximity to home gets him over over the top and 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 brings these brings these wins home. Certainly. What else? Oh, I, I think I think there's opportunity, very good opportunity right now. Um, so the Copa America and the Euro Cup are starting soon. Oh, I've boy. placed a couple here wagers here. Now, oh, with the look ahead money lines, I don't expect them to change a ton by the time the actual tournaments start. So you could wait. But right now, you can build out a plus 173 parlay if you look at the U.S. to beat Panama, Uruguay mm-hmm. to beat Bolivia, 
I didn't know Bolivia oh. was competing in the Copa America until I placed this bet. Brazil to beat Paraguay. Now that's a, that's a shaky, scary bet. That's only minus 275 on that leg. And then Brazil to beat Costa Rica. That's looking at a plus 172 right there with four look ahead lines. Also, kind of the Euro Cup got a five leg parlay there locked yeah. in. Saw these matchups and had to lock it in right away. Of course, you got Germany right. over Scotland. I think that's that's very easy. Germany with Julian Nagelsmann as a manager. I liked his tactics with Bayern Munich. Don't know why they fired him, or I should say, sacked him. Uh, as, yeah, sacked, as it is, thank you. As it is yep. soccer, yep. yes, Nagelsmann out, as they say. Um, yes. <laughs> Fran- Fr- France to beat Austria. England to okay, beat Denmark, that's close, minus 165, but I, I like the like way it. that's stacking up. Jude Bellingham, yeah. 20-year-old midfielder for Real Madrid, playing at that top form of his life. He'll be the catalyst there. Germany yeah. to beat Hungary, minus 335. I would have taken that all the way up to minus 400, so definitely go ahead and jump on that. And then England to beat Serbia. Serbia's tricky. They play with a lot of pride, but I don't think they have the talent to get it over the top. Um, yeah. And that is plus 432, Matt. $100 to win 431. Okay. All right, nice. Um, I've got I've got a quick uh, number two. Um, it's one eight hundred two seven zero seven one one seven for uh, just call it number. Just call it. I'm okay. Not gonna, Am I going to call yeah. him and tell him I can't be stopped? Is that what I'm calling to tell him? If you would like, yeah, yeah, I think so. Just yeah, call the gambling hotline and tell him how hot you are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, wow! I gotta say, that was an unplanned segment. I'm shocked at all the info I got. Uh, I'm gonna listen back to this. Absolutely, start making financial decisions. So, um, yeah, I, I do like I do like the I do like the Salome Davids I play for the PPA because kind of the way I saw well, it, she's always the underdog. Yeah, yeah. Right. she's always the underdog. But the thing is, is when I watch and I, I watched very closely, Matt. I, I I analyzed and I saw that the talent level that she has far supersedes the odds you can get her at. The issue is okay. is a lot of unforced errors and sloppy play. She can clean up Don't the consistency it. a little bit, especially the yeah. net play, like right in front of the kitchen. She she okay. kind of isn't very strong in that sense, but great return of service, great service herself. If she can clean up the consistency a little bit, the talent, the hard parts of the game, she's already mastered. So that's what the, I like. The Nick Kyrgios of women's tennis just that's absolutely exactly right. in every way. That is exactly right. <laughs> just... If you had to rate on a scale of one to hundred, like a video game, two as far as dis- <laughs> as far as discipline goes, just yeah, I like it. Has That's he good. played? Has he played for a title since that Wimbledon that he lost to the Joker? No, that Wimbledon will always hold a special place in my heart. That that yeah. was that was nice. God, that, yeah. yeah. It is Electric sickening how many sports we have like a C plus knowledge of. Too way too many. No, oh my God, yeah. It's uh, what, what is it like? Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Like that's that's kind yes. of yeah. That's a sports. The man. next sport that I would like to get more into is water polo. This Olympic season, that's what oh, I'll be watching. I, in my opinion, that's the hardest sport on the planet. I mean, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we did it. that. I think that. <laughs> the, uh, nice. Oh, you have a, Do you have a comment for anyone to make? Is there? Pickleball com- uh, emoji or pickle emoji? Yeah, pickle emoji mm, would be great. Yes, I think and great. soccer ball, pick pickle emoji and soccer ball for yes, the. Uh, mind. I'll put it at four people that are still listening right now. Yes, um, yes. Hopefully cool. nobody tailed any of these bets because they're all going to be offers except maybe the Euro Cup bet. <laughs> That's just, yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Well, GT, I'm excited to get rich with you. Next time we talk, yes, I will be on uh, a yacht in the Caymans. Uh, so yep. yeah, can't, can't wait, man. Yeah, good time. Yeah. I agree. We'll we'll probably have to delay the episode because we'll be busy cleaning our money and not paying taxes from oh, points bet sportsbook or whatever this is. Fanatics. Really quick. Uh yeah. in, in instant That's thoughts. Uh, how many how many commits do you promise between now and next Wednesday? Instant. instant. Can that in, can that include Collier Collier from last week? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll, we'll we'll give you that one. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess two. I don't wow, know. Yeah, 13? Two. 13? You broke up a little bit. I could, wow, 13 <laughs> commits from JT is what he's claiming. Whoa. All right. Well, can we talk about all 13 of them? Yeah. <laughs> Next episode, we're bowling right. Rutgers this weekend. <laughs> I got to I gotta spend more time investigating what's going on there. Hopefully people sure. got the Sopranos references. I should go back and finish that show. I caught most but, of them. Most. That, 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 does, that does remind me. Someone's looking for a show to watch in the comedy space. The, that genre, the best show that I could possibly recommend, but you have to watch it all the way through because then you don't appreciate the character arcs if you stop too early, is Veep with Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who was Elaine mm-hmm. in Seinfeld. I believe she won a Grammy, or not a Grammy, an Emmy for like the best lead actress in a comedy. Every single season the show is on. 
a phenomenal show. The reason I remember it is because every time I re-subscribe to Max to continue watching The Sopranos, Veep is only on Max, so I would mark him on watching both of those shows together. Well-rounded. Look at you. Yes. Nice. Nice. Yes. Heck yeah, man. All there right. No more tangents that I can think of off the top of my head right now. Right. And with that, we will save the discussion on the GameStop meme trading uh, for <laughs> next week's episode. And uh, we will leave you with that. So appreciate everyone yeah. for tuning in and we'll see you next time.